That's good. All right, good evening. Why do we always die right there? Good evening. evening. Woohoo! All right. Hey, we got somebody visiting on Wednesdays back there. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Welcome. All right, I won't keep you guys too long on the announcements and the pre-service stuff. Thank you all for being here very much. Did everybody have a good Christmas? Yeah. Woo, busiest ever, but it was wonderful. But I hated seeing Zach and Seago because they have Seamus with them. I didn't mean that. I missed him terribly. All right. Um, I'll throw out our normal uh, announcements for prayer, but I think we do have one announcement for the men's group that I need to put out really quick. Right, Chris? And that is, he was telling Jack, Jack, tell me if I get this wrong. Men's group will meet, they will not meet tomorrow. I mean, they will not meet this Monday or the following Monday. Their first meeting will be on the 16th of January. Okay. That's what the order says. Okay. All right. So men's group will meet on the 16th. I'm going to have to go back to Oscars with you guys. That was awesome. How's Kyler's arm going before we open in prayer? Kinzer's. Kyler, arm. Doing well? Okay, he's tough. All right. Good deal. Ashley, how's mom? Where, oh, you're with her. Okay. She doing well? All right. Um, Carrie, unspoken, still unspoken? All right. Things going well? Things going well? All right. Didn't learn much out of that inquiry. <laughs> okay. Uh, and... These are the ones I ask you to always have in your prayers. Um, Linda Painter, I haven't heard in a while, but I know that she's going through, she's, okay, she's going through so much. Uh, My brother, Jim Gabehart, be in prayer for him always for his health, but especially for his unspoken that is nearest and dearest to his heart, even more so than his health. Um, Sees grandfather, love that man. I've gotten to know him more and more through the Christmas holiday. I've never seen such a sacrificial guy for, for his family and for his God. He's an awesome guy. And he, he takes chemo daily and will the rest of his life. Daily. And he's upbeat and he's tough and he's taking care of his family. So please remember him in prayer. And David Robertson, my brother-in-law and my sister Ann, uh, both facing some serious tests. Um, and uh, of course, David has stage four cancer, but he's holding firm, and right now everything is in complete remission. So, but it's never going to go away with him. It's going to—you're just waiting to see where it'll come back. So he's facing a lot, and I'm assuming, Joan, that that you're getting clear with all the pneumonia. You're looking good. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and Zayshon, I ask you guys to always keep Zayshon in your prayers. And add to that uh, Marva Ledbetter. She came here for years until she moved away. And now she's back closer in town. So we're hoping we get to see her more and more. But she, it was precious that she felt led to come to you guys when she felt like God was telling her to have a church pray for her. Uh, she's facing cancer as well. It's everywhere. And so she has been anointed and she did it biblically. She came. And she requested of the elders to be anointed for healing. And so we have been faithful. And so now, be in bold prayer for all these people. All right? Stand with me if you would. (sighs) Hope that worked. Nope. I'll be looking over my shoulder. All right. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Our Heavenly Father. We praise your name. We lift you up for all that you've done, all you are doing. We give you reverence. We give you worship. We give you thanks. We owe you everything. You are our everything. Help us now through the Spirit to reach out to you, to be one with you, to as your children, as a group, as a church, to lift you up in true spiritual, joyful praise and worship. And I ask you, Lord, help us be where you are in the word. Take us where you want us to go. Open it up to us as only you can. Let it apply to our hearts. Let the right people hear this message and messages coming from all over this nation that are truly founded in your word. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Because you were forsaken
Jesus and you are my King. And you are my King. Jesus and you are my Heavenly Father, I just ask you now to be with us. Let us be with you. Let us join you. I know you so every time we meet, you more than anybody want us to, to truly get your word. I ask you to bring it alive, Lord, to all of us. Let us delve in. Let us see you clearly. Let us apply it to our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's precious name, they all say it. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, we're going to go through two judges tonight. Woohoo! Uh, we almost could get further, but I've got some really awesome points that, that have been thrown at me in this uh, chapter, and I want to make sure to give ample time for them. 
So we spend four or five weeks going through one judge, and then we can cover two in one night. It's just all depending on how much is covered in them. And uh, <clears throat> this one is going to have so much relevance for us here. In, I mean, the book of Judges has been so relevant for us as a people in this nation anyway. But tonight's really going to dig deep. Uh, give you a quick catch up. Some of you are new to it, and I'm, I'm not going to go as in-depth as I did last week catching us up, but we're in and out with these Christmas series, and so I've got to make sure we know where we are. Gideon has passed away. This will probably be the last time we'll talk about him, but it's springboarding off of Gideon again. Uh, and after Gideon died, what happened to the land? Surprise. It fell into idolatry, right? Uh, he had how many sons? Seventy sons. One was with a concubine. Does anybody remember his name? Abimelech. Abimelech. So he was the son of a Canaanite concubine. All the rest were Israelites. So he was half Canaanite. So he turned on all the others. He rose up and murdered them all on one stone. Whether he beheaded them, bashed their heads in, I don't know. But he killed them all, made a big show of it. And then he forcibly took over as king. And uh, one of the 70 sons... Does anybody remember his name? I'm going to try this baby one more time. It's out. Jotham. Yes, very good. Escaped, and he didn't know it. So Jotham went to the mountain of Mount Gerizim. And uh, that mountain, there were two mountains beside each other. One was blessings, one was cursings that were announced to the Israelites when they first arrived in the land. He stood on the Mount of Blessing, and he told them, I'm the only one standing up here. You killed all my brothers and you've turned against God and you've got a king against his will and so basically he's saying you've been cursed and his curse was from God that Abimelech is such an evil king and everybody was evil for voting him in that Abimelech will be devour the people with fire and the people will devour Abimelech with fire and within three years it's exactly what happened they had gotten so tired of his evil reign that they turned on him he turned on them and they just destroyed each other okay that's where we are we're going to pick up the story there uh, I wish I could see it down there. I'm going to probably make mistakes up here because I can't see what I'm doing. You have this void now. Gideon's gone. His sons are gone. Abimelech's dead. And that's where we're stepping into the story. So if you're listening, give me an amen. amen. All right, here we go. Chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son, the son of Pua the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in the mountains of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years, and he died, and he was buried in Shamir. Now, he is one of, and I'm going to keep looking this way. Sorry to you guys out there. Uh, he's one of six judges that are called minor judges. We have six major judges. We have, thank you, six minor judges. Uh, minor judge, for those of you that were not here long ago when we started this, does not mean that they didn't necessarily do as much. It meant that there's not a lot written about them. And what I just read to you about Tola, <laughs> that's it. That's all. We, we're done with him. So, didn't work? <laughs> I mean, thanks for trying. Oh, it did work. Eat crow. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, now, Tola means... Uh, He's the one we're going to cover, and then we're going to cover Jair, or Yair, how they pronounce it. Uh, Tola means, let me get this right, crimson worm or scarlet. So we don't know a lot about Tola besides some of his ancestry. When you come from ancestry of uh, Pua and Dodo, and then you're called the bloody worm, I'm thinking you're not going to pick biblical names from this section of scripture if you're trying to name your kid. But uh, in this, actually, this worm, this scarlet worm that he's named after is the worm that has been pressed to make the dye that's actually even used in the tabernacle tapestries that we talked about Sunday, the tabernacle and temple. So his name was actually pretty cool. We know almost nothing about him. What I read to you was it. So here's what we can get out of what we read because we need to know this. One, he was a sixth judge. He's from the tribe of Issachar. He lived in uh, Ephraim. But uh, scholars don't, scholars, and I agree with them on this, there's not anything written about a nation rising up against them or him having to take arms and defend Israel. I don't think that 
in his time, there was an opposition. I think he just rose up as the head or major judge of the nation because they did not have a king. So he would judge the law amongst the people like Deborah was doing before she was called to defend the nation, right? She was already standing as a judge because you don't have a king, so you have a judge that does not rule, but he is the one that you come before to have decisions made. And it was his job to be sure this is God's law. We're following God. We don't fall into idolatry. And he ruled for 22 years. And during that entire time, especially after coming from such a terrible time with uh, Abimelech, the nation stayed away from idols. So he might not have fought battles, but it looks as though he did a good job because he kept Israel on the straight and narrow during his time. But that's all we know about him. So it was a very simple. But again, this is where you see scriptures... Um, being so trustworthy. They tell what happened and how it happened. And I love that. And it's, it's giving us a history of, of every judge that came. And it's also very important to know that during that 22 years, they stayed faithful because we're, getting, we're about to see what happens next. Now, 23 years, he ruled, excuse me. All right. Now, that's all we know about uh, Tola. We're going to go on to the next one already. <clears throat> the seventh judge was... Jair, or Yair, and uh, he is also a lesser judge. Now, this will show you where they were both from. Tolar was uh, from the area of West Manasseh, and Jair was on the other side. He's the only judge that we have so far that's actually come from the east side. Now, if you guys will remember, see if I have this, yes. Everything over here, these three tribes, East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, uh, that's not part of the original plot of the promised land God was going to get. Remember, they decided, hey, this is beautiful land. Just let us stay here after we help you take it. And they did. And it's caused them problems ever since. But that's where they stayed. So Jair is the first judge that's actually coming out of the east side. All right, here's what we know about him. It's the same thing as Tola. He did not rule during a time, according to what we're going to read here, uh, of any nations rising up. Verse 3. After him, Tola, arose Jair, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now, this is the only thing they add on. Here we go. Now, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 don donkeys. They also had 30 towns. They like 30, which are called Havoth Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. Now, the only thing added on besides the fact that it doesn't show that he had anyone to fight. He wasn't a military judge. So he held them to the fire as far as he kept them according to the law. They didn't fall into idolatry during his time, so he did a good job. But here's the problem. We're starting to see a pattern now. Uh, poor Gideon, what did he do that was wrong in his last days? In his pride and in his, where the people just loved him so much, he started, even though he didn't take the title of king, neither did Tola, neither did Jair. They stayed faithful not to step up as a king, right? They did well. But if you notice with Jair... He had how many sons? 30. So how many wives must he have had? Because that's just the sons, not talking about the daughters. So he took multiple wives. He became a polygamist. So he was doing what Gideon was doing. It's like, okay, I won't be king. I'll keep you walking the straight and narrow, but I'm going to enjoy this, right? So, and he had 30 sons that rode what? 30 donkeys. Okay, and that day, having a donkey, remember Deborah's song where she was telling all the officials to go and tell the poor people what God had done. She was telling the ones that were riding the donkeys. If you rode a donkey, you were a king or a high official in those days. It was the equivalent of a Lamborghini or your limousine. Okay, They were the stuff. So he had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. So they all have their Corvette. <laughs> and they're all in charge of a city. doesn't mean they're acting like kings. It means they're like mayors or governors of these cities. And... Uh, those cities were called Havath Jair. It means tent cities of Jair. Um, so all 30 of his sons had been given prestigious positions. They had prestigious rides to get there. And he was living on the high horse. So again, pride had crept in. He was doing what he should do as judge. But he was... What I want you to notice, when, you, when you're going back to the original... Um, let me make sure because I always get ahead of myself. The original judges, Othniel, Ehud, Deborah. I honestly have to say Deborah probably had the most character of any judge in the book. She was precious. 
But all of them had integrity and character. If you notice, as we've gone along in the book of Judges, the farther we go from Moses and Joshua, the more you begin to see the character deterioration in the Judges until we get to the next few and you're like, whew, if that's all God had to choose from, they're in bad shape. And it kind of sort of was. So we're starting to see it slip. We're, we're seeing this guy kind of do what Gideon did. Now, he still held him on the straight and narrow, but he's got a lot of pride. All right. So during these times, 20, 23 years for the first one, 22 years for this one, 45 years, they did stay free of idolatry and they walked as they should. And they had been basically free and in peace, no military oppression. All right. That's where we are thus far. Now, it's getting ready to change and we're going to get into a really good lesson here. <clears throat> Verse 6. Then the children of Israel, now this is after Jair died and was buried in Kamon. Okay, Jair is dead, no judge. Then the children of Israel again did evil, we're in between judges, did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Now listen to this. Why did God destroy all the Canaanite cities? Because they served pagan gods and they were doing crazy stuff and they were just devouring themselves. Well, now, after these judges die and there's no judge, they serve the Israelites, the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Listen to these. The gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So they just were like, have at it. Let's just go get every god out there. And they were just, so they were basically doing everything that the people were doing that God commanded them to go in and kill. It just doesn't make any sense. But that's how far they've gone in just a few hundred years. But realize, how far has this nation gone in under 300 years? How much have we changed in those few generations? So you can see it very easily happen. Okay? All right. And, and there are even some of, these, some of these gods they literally were sacrificing their own children to. And we're going to see how that plays in later. All right. So now, there, there's at least five nations right there whom, whose gods they have enveloped. And have taken the place. They're not just worshiping Jehovah wrong. They've literally taken all these gods and began to worship other gods. All right. Now, <clears throat> this is really cool. And I hope you guys don't miss this. Verse 7. <clears throat> so the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines. And into the hands of the people of Ammon. From that year they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan, talking about the east side, the side that they were not originally going to occupy, okay? All the children were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah, also against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. So I want us to see this on the map so we can see what's going on, because when you read it, it all runs together. And it's a very easy picture to understand what they just said, okay? For 18 years, they begin to get oppressed because God's ticked. And this, this is big time. You're going to see a difference this time. God's been like, Savior, you fall. Savior, you fall. There comes a point God's like, you know, I am really tired of this. So God reacts differently this time. And this is why this one's special. And I'm going to stop on it in part today. But here's what's happened. After their time of peace, when God lets people roll in on them, one, the Philistines, which have already been a problem in the past, they come rolling in on the west side and they're causing issues, okay, for 18 years. But now, on the right or the east side of the Jordan, it says <clears throat> the Ammonites roll in and they're um, harassing Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, the ones that are on the other side of the Jordan. But then he says that the Ammonites have become so numerous and they're getting cocky. They've waited many, many years, hundreds of years, to get their... Revenge, I guess, against the Israelites. And they think they're big enough now. So they actually cross over the Jordan and they roll into Ephraim, Benjamin, and Judah as well. So they're on both sides of the river causing havoc. And then from the Mediterranean seaside, you got the Philistines causing havoc. And for 18 years, the Israelites are just getting pounded. Okay, this is what's going on. And they don't have a judge. For 18 years, they're just fighting. And they don't have a central leader. All right, you with me so far on what's happening? So now we're 18 years into a mess. Watch what happens. Verse 10. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, We have sinned against you because we've both forsaken our God and served the Baals. Um, 
we see a pattern, and that's why I used the picture at the beginning. I don't know how many of you have ever had an ECG, or they call it an EKG sometimes, echocardiogram. Uh, we see a pattern with the Israelites that they, they follow, and we've been talking about it for months. They follow them faithfully. They're high on the mountain. It's just like an EKG, right? And then they just plummet when, when everything's going good. And they, they stray away, and they leave him. But now I want you to, this is, this is something I just want to throw out there because, oh my gosh, as a pastor, this is probably number one issue, honestly. And we all have it to a degree. It's human nature, but I'm talking to the extreme. Um, we see people that do the same thing so often. And in my many years in the ministry now, uh, I got to be honest, our congregation, when everybody's here, we might be 80 or 90 on a good regular day. We're 60 or 70 in the congregation this size. I see it frequently, frequently. Um, people come to Christ maybe for the first time or, um, they come for counseling and they return to Christ where they may have been walking lukewarm. And it's because very often they've had some terrible times in their life. They've had a financial hard time. They've had a sickness or a death or big, big, big. They're having relationship problems and it's looking like it's just not going to work and they don't know what to do and they don't know where else to turn. And they're in the office hot and heavy and they get counseling and they begin to do things God's way. And oftentimes you, this person's sporadic or not even at church. Uh, not always. And you see them begin to work hard and you see them here every Sunday and you meet with them and you talk with them almost daily and they start to try it God's way and everything gets better. I'm telling you, I cannot tell you how many times this has happened just with me personally. It's, it's all of us, but... And they get on fire, and they serve God more, and they follow his word. They do things they haven't done, maybe weeks, months, years, maybe never. And everything goes great, and the problem goes away. And you don't see them anymore. They begin to be sporadic at church, and they don't call you anymore, and they're not talking about things anymore, and they just fade away. And every time you talk to them, there's, there's one more reason this week, and it's a good reason, but it's... This is the seventh week in a row you've had a good, you know. Um, but here's what happens. They begin to follow God's pattern and they're trusting in God because they have a problem. What were the Israelites doing? And we can sit here and we can say they were idiots. How many times do you have to keep falling and getting up before you, you go with God? I'm telling you, I could write a book thicker than a dictionary about how many times this happened just in this church in 18 years. But this is what gets me. You get desperate because you've fallen away and your life is a mess. You, you begin to get serious about God and you begin to love like he tells you and you begin to follow his will and you begin to really, really respect what he told you about life and you do it his way and everything gets better. You, you become forgiving and you, you lose your bitterness and you get help, and when, you, when it doesn't get better, you got ways of coping with it because you know God and you trust God. And you can bring that love back to that relationship, and you can cherish and honor, and you can get away from the dependency on other things, and everything just comes together. And then while it's all doing well, because all the stress is gone, you go back to what completely wrecked your life. You forget everything you were doing that made it better. How does that happen? How do you change everything about your thought process in your life and it all gets good, really good? And then because it's good, you go back to the same hell on earth that destroyed you. And you just have to shake your head and say, and I literally think this right now about people. How many stinking times are you going to fall back in the pit and destroy yourself again and then come back and try that ladder that worked so well? I don't understand it. And that's what the Israelites have done. And we're going to kind of get a glimpse of why that does happen. And what does God think about it? What does God think about it? So, because it's going to surprise you. <clears throat> so anyway, you cannot tell me that we haven't all done it. But I have watched people destroy their life five or six times in a row. Because their life looks like an EKG. Um, 
And the problem is they don't just destroy their own life. It really is. And there may be people here that feel like that this is talking about you even if nobody knows because a lot of times the EKG happens on the inside even though you do keep sitting in the pew, right? You're hot, you're on fire with God, you live in His way, and then the next week you're into pornography, you're unforgiving again, you hate the world, you blame God, you doubt God, and then you're strong again, and it's up and down depending on what's going on in your life. Um, I want you to really listen to me. Please, if you're listening, say amen. God loves you more than life. Listen. But God is not naive. It's not like he doesn't see your heart. It's not like he doesn't see tomorrow. He's not stupid. He's not a pushover. He keeps helping you out of the gutter. If you keep climbing out and jumping back in, he keeps helping you out of the gutter because he loves you. Not because he's a pushover. Not because you pulled one over on him. Not because you got him fooled. Because he knows you're an idiot and I'm an idiot. He knows we're using him. But he's hoping we can see in his long suffering and compassion that he keeps picking us up out of the gutter that it might just be true that he loves us more than his own life. And a lot of people take that as his weakness. And that's just really sad. Um, he puts up with our manipulation until... Listen, until he allows it to be apparent to you after so many times. It's not for him, he knows. Until he allows it to be apparent to you and apparent to the world that you're just a manipulating little ninny and there's no real passion there. Did you hear what I just said? God's going to keep on helping you because he loves you, but he's also doing it to prove a point, to show you that, okay, this is the fifth or sixth time you've done this, that, so maybe you're not really trying to follow me. And he wants the world to see, maybe you're not really trying to follow me. Um, so that we can realize we are just playing games. If we will be intelligent enough and selfless enough to admit it. And he's done this with Israel. He's picked them up. He's brushed them off. He's showed them he's loved them. He's picked them up. He's brushed them off. He's shown them he's loved them. And it's become a cycle, right? So I want you to see what happens when God sees us fall into this cycle of manipulation. His love doesn't change. But he can be driven to a point. Okay? Pay close attention. <clears throat> so the Lord said to the children of Israel, after they cried out and said, We have sinned. We've forsaken you. We want to make it right. This is the answer. Verse 11. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, also the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Maonites, which are the Midianites? They oppressed you and you cried out to me and I delivered you from their hand. Yet, after I did all of that, after I picked you up and defended you all those times, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Listen to this next line. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. We have never heard God say that. One time in the whole book of Judges. He said, I have had it. You come to me and you ask forgiveness. Look how many times I've delivered you. Look how many times I've gone to pick you up from your house when you had a fight with your wife and you were drunk and you were acting like an idiot. Look how many times I've helped you and you said you were going to get yourself straight. You know what he's saying right here? God's saying, I'm not going to be your enabler. That's what he's saying. Because I love you. After so long, you become an enabler and you're helping no one. And it's obvious you don't care about me and you're just using me, right? That's pretty much... God's saying, in effect, I've set you free from your sins and troubles. I've picked you up. i saved you over and over. Um, I've gone after you. I've brought you back to me when you didn't want to come back. But not this time. And not this time because you, this is why. Because you are not sincere and you never really have been. Or we wouldn't be here again, would we? I really wish people that play this game would just be that honest with themselves. You're not sincere. And if you were, we wouldn't be here again, would we? It doesn't change how God feels about you. Don't you blame God because he's not going to drag you out of the ditch for the 23rd time. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's because you've never loved him. If you can fall into a cycle like that over and over. God's saying, you've shown your true desire is not for me. And it, here's what he's saying. And we're going to see this as we read on. Are you listening? He's saying, if you are so adamant about proving that you love these things more than me and you keep turning back to them every time I help you, every time I show you the way, every time I get you out of it and you still turn back around because your love for that is more than me, 
Okay, then. I'm not going to help you this time. I want you to go on back to what you love so much. I'm going to give you over to what you love. I'm going to stop bothering you. And let's see if what you love helps you out of things the same way I have. That's what he's saying. Okay? Um, we see this so often when people... It's, it's so amazing when you, you learn the love, the hope, the forgiveness, the cherishing, the honoring. You learn all these new things that help you through something. Gives you a new lot on life and changes everything. And then you just abandon it all and go back to the same crap that destroyed you. And it's because you needed anything in desperation to fix your life. And that happened to be the tool. But you really loved what destroyed your life more. And when the anxiety and the trouble is over, you're just going to go back to it. Because that love never went away. God was just a tool. Um, that's kind of what we look like. It really is. <clears throat> it's a perfect picture. So, God reaches a point, And it's not out of hatred or abandonment. And I want to I wanna throw this out there right. And I want you to get this if we get nothing else. I want you to listen because I know you know people that are in this situation and I know some of us in here might be fighting it on ourselves. Okay? God reaches a point not out of hatred or abandonment but out of true, listen, deep love. The same way I might love a child that continues to destroy their life and I keep enabling them because I keep going back and rescuing them and I'm ruining them and I love them too much. So I have to do something that literally makes me want to commit suicide because I have to draw the hard line in love the love never stops. But I cannot continue to enable them. That's where God gets pushed in our lives. And when it happens, then we want to shake our fists like he's so evil. Because we're idiots. And he still loves us. But when he does it, he turns us over to what we're chasing. And he does it in hopes that when we get what we really, really, really want, and he doesn't rescue us again, and he lets the sin take its full effect. And he says, I will no longer fight you, drag you back. My hand is off. I'm going to give you over. And then he's hoping that it will so destroy us when we realize that it, it won't save us. And it's horrible. And I've really messed up. He's hoping that that will be the one thing to make us finally lose that love that seems to be stronger than our love for him. Um. And I want you to listen to this because it's spoken of by Paul and Jesus very, very directly. This exact thing that just happened in Judges where God says, eh, I'm done. I'm taking my hands off of you. Um, is the exact same thing. And verse 14 says this. He says, therefore, I will deliver you no more. This is the book of Judges. I will deliver you no more. Go, verse 14, and cry out to the gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. It's like, I'm done. Go back to your stuff. See if it'll help you. Now, let's go up to the New Testament and see how it connects. Are you ready? Romans 1. It's kind of a long passage, but I want you to get it all. And I want you to understand because we need to get a grasp on what God's saying here. Some people take this as um, I'm in total... God will never love me again. And some people just gloss over it and don't pay attention to it and do what they want to do. I want you to get it for what it says. All right? Romans one twenty one. For although, and he's talking about us, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. But they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. Stop. Is that not almost verbatim what God said to the people in the book of Judges? I'm going to just give you over to it. I'm done. Okay? To the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature themselves rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason... God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men 
and receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God again, listen, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. That's what you want. Have at it. I'm tired of fighting you. Okay. What does that mean about his, his attitude towards us or our future with him? We'll find out. Verse 29. They were filled with... Listen to all the things and tell me it doesn't describe us today. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness. Covetousness is wanting more. Malice, meaning I'm just constantly bitterly against you. I, everything I say, everything I do is just with bitter hatred. Okay, that's malice. They're full of envy. Murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. He's saying this is how bad it's gotten. And I'm just going to give you over to your thoughts because every time I fight and try to bring you back, you choose it over me. So I'm going to let you have it. We'll see how you like it. That's what he's saying. Okay. Now, what we all need to realize is God loves us more than anything, even there. But he will not. You've got to get this. He will not be used. And he will not be mocked. Um, so we can use him for our own security and purposes. And I want you to listen. You can be pushed. You can push God to the point that he does draw the line in the sand and say, I dare you to do this one more time. And we don't want to see God that way. And I'm telling you, it's not because he's evil. It's because he does love you. It's because as your father and Jesus seeing you as his beloved bride will not will not hold back any punches to try and save us. He will draw a line and say, you step one more time. But we just don't see God that way. Today, anything goes. If you judge me on anything, if you're angry at me, if I've let you down 50 times, then you just better shut up and suck up and let me do it one more time or you're not loving. No, the fact is, if that's how you act, you're not loving. And God is too loving to let us do it. And we got to get the fact that scriptures are very, 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 very very clear that he will finally draw a line and say, you will not mock me anymore and you will not show this kind of hatred towards me and mankind anymore. Step one more time. And many people have stepped over the line and then they're mad at him for what comes. So we see that he said it in the New Testament and we see that he just said it to his group of Israelites. So we're going to finish up and we're going to see what happens. What happens when you get to that point with God? Because there's a lot of us that are there, okay? <clears throat> so he says, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Go cry to your gods. Go have at it. I'm going to give you over to your reprobate mind to have what you want. Uh, let's see how you do. 15. This is how they react when he tells them that. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Now, they never do this before. Listen to what they say. We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. Listen to this. We're going to come back to it after we read the last paragraph. Talking about God. They put away their foreign gods. Now notice they said, do whatever is best. Do whatever you see fit to us. Go ahead and punish us. We deserve it. Just don't leave us. It's the first time they've ever said that. So the repentance seems real. And then following that statement, they put away the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. So not only did they for the first time say, punish us, we deserve it, we understand, just don't leave us. Oh, and by the way, we're going to go and we're going to act. This is called repentance. Repentance means turn, it means change, it means go another way. It doesn't mean get some fancy lip service so you can get a blessing. It means whatever it costs me, I'm going to change. And if you have to punish me for you to stay here Punish me. Because, by the way, as soon as you're done whooping me, I'm going to go in the house and throw everything away that, that shouldn't be there. Because I'm going to show you that I'm that serious. I really do love you. Okay? It's like the guy who goes to his wife, whom he's cheated on, and says, I will never call her again. I will throw away her number. I will throw away these pictures. I will throw away the gifts that she gave me. 
to show you that I'm done. What if he says, oh, honey, I'm so sorry I didn't mean that. And you go in the closet and you find every gift that she ever gave him and all the pictures and everything else and all the love letters. Would you really think that he meant it? So they're saying, let me go clean my closet. And by the way, no matter how mad you get at me, go ahead and do it because I deserve it. But I'm still here and I still want you. So this is a real repentance. It's not just lip service for the first time, maybe. <clears throat> and this is what I love. This is how God responds. So they put away the foreign gods, verse 16, from among them and served the Lord. Listen to God's response. And his, God's soul, could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Uh, this is the most awesome thing. His answer is awesome. The Hebrew word there, it says his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. That word is kosar. And what it means is this. He can no longer bear. He's impatient. He's vexed. He's frustrated. He's worried. He's deeply grieved. It means you have put me through it until I cannot come pull you out of it again. So I'm going to give you over to it. And then God, instead of running away and saying, I hope you die in the mud. God is standing there, this word, vexed, grievous, anxious, and hurting, saying, could you please, when is this going to break you? When are you going to turn around? When are you going to come back? I've been through this with people that I love. And you have to take a hard line, and then you just are broken every day in prayer and in hopes and anxiety. And some of you have been through this too. Just hoping today's the day. Listen to me. That is the picture that God is painting with that one verse, much less the other verses that I will read to you. He was deeply vexed and grieved and frustrated and anxious that they would return home. It says he could no longer endure and bear having to hold that line. Of course, he would because he's a holy God that wants to either correct us or get rid of us. And by the way, if you choose to never, ever, ever go back to him against his own will, he will do the only thing he can do to you. He will put you away. Because he can't let you hurt others. But it won't be because it didn't break his heart. So, he's vexed, he's frustrated, he's, he's grieved. <clears throat> he's lovesick and he wants him to come home. And there's a lot of people that I know that have read verses and they, they contact me very frequently because they get this thing in their mind. I knew God was real, I knew what he was telling me, and I didn't do it, and therefore I guess I'm lost forever because God had to give me over to a reprobate mind. Well, did he not say that he gave them over to their sins in a reprobate mind? And what was he doing while he gave them over to a reprobate mind? I have given loved ones over to their own lusts. Does it mean that I gave up on them and didn't love them and that they didn't have a home if they chose to came, come home? No, but it meant that I wouldn't go after them anymore because it was fruitless. That's what it means when God says, I will give you over to your reprobate sinful mind. I hope it breaks you. I hope it drives you home. I will not chase you into the mud anymore, but I'm here. But if I go pick you up, I'm going to ruin it. Do you understand that? If you don't come back to him, you're gone. He's let you go. But it doesn't mean that he's not still there calling you. And that's what you've got. On, and I want to show you in Scripture that that's not me trying to make something up in my head. <clears throat> Listen to this. Psalm 81, 11. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Same thing. Gave them over to their reprobate minds. Verse 13. Oh, that my people, talking about the people he gave over. This is his mentality while they're given over to their stubborn hearts. Oh, that my people would listen to me. That Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies, turn my hand against their foes. Those that hate the Lord would cringe towards him, and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Here God's saying, if you would just come home, uh, I would bless you and satisfy you. But uh, you, you've shown me you don't love me, so until you repent, I'm giving you over to your lusts. Now listen to Jesus' parables because people say, well, <clears throat> okay, I, I turned on God. He, he turned me over to my reprobate mind. That means God's done with me and I'm lost forever. Have you ever, you may have felt that way yourself. I'm going to give you scriptural references, although what I just gave you is enough. The book of Judges says he gave them over to their lust, but he still pursues and saves them. We'll see. 
the psalm that we just read says he gave them over to their reprobate minds, but he still longed for them to turn and he was willing if they would. Now listen to this one. Jesus giving parables. Luke 15 verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep? How many did he have? He had in his possession. They were his sheep. He was the shepherd of how many? One hundred. If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost. It's only lost because it was already in his possession. Okay? Until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. All right, then he goes to another parable, Luke 15, 8. Or what woman, woman having 10 silver coins, how many coins did she have in her possession that were her treasure? She had 10. If she loses one coin, she only lost it because it was already in her possession. Does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In both cases, in both stories, Jesus compares the joy that they have and the party they throw to the joy of God himself. Now, I don't care what you believe theologically, that you knew him in in knowledge only, and then you walked away, and then you came back, or that you knew him, and then you chose to turn on him, and then he accepted you back. The picture's still the same. You went away, and he didn't give up. He went after you, full blast, okay? So yes, you can walk away. Yes, you can turn your back. Yes, you can knowingly. There's, there is no sin unless you knew better when you did it. Scriptures say to sin is to know the law and not keep it. Okay, so anytime we sin, it's, <laughs> if God's going to count it against us, it's because we knew better. But listen to this. The last one's the most powerful of all. If you listen, say amen. Luke 15, 8. <clears throat> and he, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. He had two sons. They were his sons. Okay. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, he's calling him father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Give me my inheritance. He divided his property between them. They both were his sons. They both called him father. One of them took his inheritance, took what was given to him freely that he hadn't earned because his father loved him. Sound familiar? And what did he do? He counted it as worthless. And he squandered it. Luke 15, 8. Not many days later, the son gathered all he had, took a journey into the far country, left his father, took the inheritance, and counted it as worthless. Squandered his property in reckless living, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose. He got problems in his life. Why? Because his father had given him over to his reprobate mind. He didn't chase him. He didn't go out and sit in the pig pen with him. He didn't try to shelter him. He didn't pay his way. He didn't call and pay for the hotel bill. He said, I love my son, but you've made this choice. I'm going to give you over to your choices. Go have at it. And then all hell breaks loose. He spent everything. A severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Did the father allow him to lay there in his needs unhelped? Yes. Did he allow him to squander away everything he had given him freely? Yes. And you think, well, daddy's done with me, just like we think when we've done it again. And I will tell you that if you're just playing him, he knows it. That's the key. You are lost if that's the case. But listen to what happens. Why did he leave him to his own reprobate attitude? Why did he let him squander everything and live horribly and not go after him, not get him out of the gutter? What man would let his son sit out in a pig pen and eat pig slop? What man would let him die out in the wilderness and not go after him? The man that knows, number one, he's got his own free will. And if I bring him back against his will when it's not time and he's not broken, he's just going to do it again. And I love him too much. But also the man that knows that everything he's going through might be the only chance to snap him out of his idiocy. And I love him too much not to go ahead and take the chance. 
So, the boy does finally get broken and realize that my ways are really dumb and I really blew everything my dad worked so hard to give to me that I didn't deserve. I don't even know how he could forgive me. I really realize how dumb I am and how stupid I look and I really realize how badly I hurt him. I realize when he was headed home, it wasn't, I'm going to go home, sweet talk dad, see if he'll give me a few more bucks. Do you think dad would have accepted him? No. And that's the way a lot of us return to God. Well, I don't really want God, but I'm still in trouble and I'm tired of eating pig slop, so I'm going to go back and try to sweet talk him again. If that's the case, you get a closed door in your face because God loves you and he's still waiting for you to be broken or never come back. But if you, in your mind, do what this kid did and you say, oh my gosh, look what I've done. Look what I've blown. Look how I hurt him. I don't deserve to be his son. I don't deserve to be here. Maybe he'll let me work for him as a hired hand because I'm not even going to ask him to accept me as a son because I've disgraced him. That, you know what that's called? Repentance. Boy, was I wrong. I'd rather work as a slave now than be doing what I'm doing because I was such an idiot. Yet I've hurt my dad so much I'm not even going to begin to ask him to take me back. That's repentance. That was real, okay? If you come to the Father, even if you took what he had and you throw it away, even if you spit in his face and say, Daddy, I'm leaving you, and you run off, he's not done with you. He will not come help you because it's your choice, because he loves you. And he either wants you to be broken and come home, or he's done with you because you can't hurt the other kids. But either way, even then, when he gives you over to a reprobate mind, it is so that he will stare at you longingly with anxiety, saying, Oh, please be broken and come home. And if you make the choice with real repentance, real. So I can't stress this enough because this is what, as bad and sinful as I am, it makes me sick to my stomach to see it happen over and over. So I can't imagine how God feels. When I see people come in here with their sloppy grins, talking smack because they're in trouble again, and I know this is the fifth time in your life that I've done this, you don't mean a bit of it. And then I have to pray because I'm sinning because I'm judging their heart. But you get tired of it. I can imagine how God feels being manipulated that way. Watch how the father reacts. One of the sweetest sections of the Bible. Luke 15, 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will rise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And he means this. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off. So what does that mean daddy was doing every day? And you're gone and you're kicking rocks and you're screaming at God and you're shaking your fist. God will not be played with. He will not be manipulated. He will stand firm. He will destroy you. But the whole time, guess what his heart is? Please, please drop your sword. I want you so bad. It's not... Never again. It's not my door's closed forever. It's son, just come home. So while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran, which was against everything in that culture for the patriarch of the family to run. It was a disgrace. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. The picture is that God runs to you. There's not a word wasted in Scripture. These are Jesus' own words. When you're the idiot that did it again, but you finally did get broken when he gave you over to your stinking life, when you finally are broken, my God, with absolutely no pride and his honor thrown in the trash, will run to you with a broken heart because he's so hungry to have you home. If people could get that, Satan has made some people not repent in the mud because they think there is no hope and they don't think God will do that. You need to go read the scriptures because it's written all over them. It's not just this one story. Well, it was a still long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servants, he didn't even answer him. He's like, give me a kiss. The father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. 
Catch that word again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. What you got to get out of this is God don't play no games. But stop, listen. You are never, ever beyond his grace. You are one real, heartbroken repentance away from his grace. What people have got to understand, they've got to understand both sides of this coin. I'm telling you, I could scream both sides of this coin. One is stop manipulating God, thinking he's a pushover because he's showing you grace and mercy. The other shoe is going to fall and you will be destroyed because he loves you and he won't let you play games. He will destroy you. You don't know. Keep pushing it. Keep playing and thinking you're getting away with something. He loves you too much. But on the flip side, if you truly do come to yourself and you truly are broken and you truly realize you made a fool of him and you, and you spent his inheritance and you don't deserve him and he really should leave you there, when you finally realize that, he will run to you in tears and celebrate. Not bring you in the back door so nobody will see and not talk to you for a month. He will run to you in the front lawn and cry on your shoulder while the world watches and says, why are you bringing that kid back? <clears throat> Romans ten thirteen, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts two twenty one, And it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jeremiah 33, 8. I will purify them from all the wrongs that they've committed against me. I will forgive all the wrongs that they've committed against me, rebelling against me. John 16, 8. There's only one way. And I want, I want you to really get this picture and not get it confused because this will clear it up all for you and then we're going to be done, okay? John 16, 8. When he, the Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So there's no way you can even be repentant unless who works in your heart? Spirit. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is what I want you to ask yourself. One, evaluate yourself. Why are you with him right now? Why have you come to him this last time? Is there somebody here needing help? You just want something from him. You should come to him for help. He's your father. But if that's the only reason you're coming. Is this your fifth or sixth heartbeat where you've risen and fallen again? Do you stay mad at him more than you stay happy with him? Even though nobody knows the heartbeats going on inside your head spiritually. Today I'm okay with him. Tomorrow I doubt him. Today I'm okay with him. Tomorrow I'm mad at him. It's the same thing. It's just the world doesn't see it. Why are you okay with him this time? Are you somebody that's constantly up and down? Understand that he's not going to be manipulated. Understand that you are going to reach a point that your life is going to crumble and nobody's going to be there to pick you up and he will make sure nobody picks you up because he loves you too much. You will not play these games forever. He sees, but he loves you. But even in that, this is what I want you to understand is going on in God's head. You say, well, if he leads me to my reprobate mind, then how can his spirit convict me? He left me. He's not with me. If the spirit's not there, then how can I even turn back to God when it's the spirit's work? It's a good question, right? Well, let me tell you this. I can tell someone in my family that has hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt my family and there's no hope, I can say, get out, I'm done, I'm not helping you anymore. And the whole time they're out there, I'm standing at the window watching and the first sign that they want to come home, I can run to them and say, you know you have a home. You know there's somewhere to go. Do you understand that? You think God can't do that? You think he doesn't understand what's going on in your heart? You think he won't let you lay there and wallow in the mud while he's looking at you longingly and the moment he sees your heart break and he knows it's real, he doesn't run and whisper in your ear and say, you know you have a home. I'm not going to come get you again. But you know you have a home. 
That's how he does it. Yes, he'll let you lay there, but he doesn't abandon you. But he's not going to help you. He's going to let you fall apart. And then he's going to whisper in your ear when you're broken and you really mean it and say, you know, I'm here. But he'll also whisper in your ear, I'm not going to come out here and chase you down. I'm done until you show me that you want me. So if that's what your spiritual life looks like and you know it, you got some things to face. And I'll tell you the bottom line, the number one thing you have to face. If that is your spiritual walk, chances are you don't know God. Chances are you're not intimate with God. Chances are you got knowledge of God, but you love yourself and you want to manipulate him to make your life better. And he's really sick of it, but he loves you. And chances are, if you die with that mentality, you will be one that hears, I never knew you. He's wanted to know you, but he's never known you. So why don't you just be honest with yourself and realize if that is your spiritual walk, that you're the one with the problem. And God hasn't abandoned you because he's mean. He abandoned you because he loves you and you forced him to in your own free will. And then understand that the minute that you have real repentance and real passion for him, he will be the one to run to you. But he ain't coming to play games because you want to manipulate him one more time. And if this is who you are, you better get over your manipulation and decide what you want. You better stay in the pig pen and die in your sludge. Or you better decide that he really, 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 really is better. And I don't just want something from him. Be like the Israelites that said what? Do what you got to to me. Make my world fall apart. I'm not even asking you to make it better anymore. Lord, punish me. Don't leave me. You get to that point of repentance, you do what the guy did in the pig pen and say, I don't even want to be your son. I don't need an inheritance. I'll die as your slave, but I'd rather be with you than be back in the mess that I created. That, when you come for no other reason than you want daddy, even if it causes you more trouble, that's when it's real repentance. And I'm begging you because I know people in the sound of my voice and probably in this room, that is your spiritual life, even if nobody knows it. I'm begging you to recognize it and just do something. And if that means walk away from them, then go ahead and do it. But you're better off than where you're living for you and for the world. But when you know that God is standing according to his own scriptures and the original language, standing there in anxiety and grief, wanting you to come home, and he's got the world to offer you, why? Why? Why do you resist him for what's destroying you anyway? Get real. Get serious. Stop being ashamed. Come home with all the mud on and in front of the whole world say, Jesus, you're awesome. I cannot believe you still love me. You would run to me now? I want you. Acts 2.21, it shall come to pass. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's close in prayer. Altars are always open. If you need me after, always here. Heavenly Father, this is one of the most awesome, most powerful, most revealing scriptures we've read in so long about your heart. All the way back to the days of Judges, 1,200 years before Christ. All the way up to the New Testament with words from Jesus Christ. You are God and you are holy and you are unbendable. But you never, ever, ever stop loving and hoping. I praise you for that. That, Lord, I say it in front of this group, and I pray that they join you in praise and agreement. That is the reason you deserve my worship. That is the reason we praise the fact that you hold all power and justice and authority. Because if any other being in the whole universe did, we would never have the love and the grace. And yet the holiness and the righteousness that you bring. Lord, help us be like you. Help us show this to other people. Help us to live for you with all of our heart wherever it takes us simply because that's how you feel about us. I pray that if there's a single person that's in agony over this sermon that they won't go home. They won't turn off their computer or their phone until they are at peace with you and all is well. Thank you for the, the saving name and, and blood and heart of our Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here i am to worship Turn. 
I have decided